Hi, I'm Zach, and I'm joined by my colleagues Craig and Pam. A quote that has been attributed to at least a dozen different individuals provides a good lens from which to focus today's episode on environmental disasters. Quote, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. For today's discussion, we'll be examining several notable American environmental disasters and what your students can learn from each. On our journey, we'll travel to Cleveland, Ohio, Londonbury Township, Pennsylvania, Prince William Sound, Alaska, and East Palestine, Ohio. So join us, and we'll kick off our exploration with a visit to the Cuyahoga River after this quick break. Welcome back. I've touted my Ohio heritage a few times on this podcast before, and unsurprisingly, I'm about to do it again. Interestingly enough, for this episode in particular, my hometown of Cortland, Ohio is just about smack dab between Cleveland and East Palestine, with Cleveland lying 50 miles to the west and East Palestine 40 miles to the south. So other than being a relatively useless factoid, why does that matter? Well, one of the primary drivers of the environmental conservation movement happened in Cleveland, and one of the most recent environmental disasters just occurred in East Palestine. These two events will serve as bookends for our podcast episode today. So let's get started. Downtown Cleveland, the Cuyahoga River, June 22, 1969. Let's find out what happened from author David Stradling. On June 22, 1969, there was a fire on the Cuyahoga River uh, at the end of navigation, uh, a couple of miles uh, south of here. Uh, end of navigation meaning boats could not go farther uh, upstream. Uh, this is where a couple of low railroad trestles blocked some debris that was coming downstream, which is not unusual, the piers from the bridge. Uh, they got soaked in oil, uh, which also was not unusual. Uh, and then there was a spark, perhaps from a passing train. We don't know exactly what set off the, the fire. And uh, the trestles burned for about 20 minutes or half an hour. They were doused by uh, both a, a fire boat and from uh, crews on the shore. Uh, photographers didn't get there in time to give us a picture of the Cuyahoga burning that time, uh, but eventually news about the Cuyahoga catching fire uh, became uh, international in scope. A subsequent Time Magazine story on the 1969 Cuyahoga River fire described the river as one which, quote, oozes rather than flows, and in which a person does not drown but decays. The magazine's creative use of the English language aside, the article and its iconic photograph may have actually overstated the 1969 event. Let's find out more. There were perhaps a dozen, maybe even more, fires on the Cuyahoga before the 1969 fire. Uh, probably the one that became most famous is a fire in 1952. It became most famous because many people began to confuse photographs of that much worse fire uh, with the fire that happened in 1969. And that's because Time Magazine, which ran a, a piece of, about water pollution uh, in August of 1969, either inadvertently or purposefully used a photograph from 1952 and simply indicated that, that this was the Cuyahoga River catching fire. Uh, that photograph um, shows a, a tugboat uh, basically trapped in flames. It was a, it was a very damaging fire uh, with firefighters training water on, on a, a very large oil slick that was burning uh, at that point. Uh, so m most people outside of Cleveland would have assumed that uh, you know, rivers don't catch fire on a regular basis, that the, what they were looking at in 1969 in Time Magazine was a photograph of something that had just happened. Uh, and, uh, and there the confusion only gets uh, more extreme, uh, that people begin to think that this was a, uh, in 1969 was a catastrophic fire, uh, that there was tremendous damage that was done that it was five stories tall, uh, that it burned for hours. I even saw somebody say that it burned for days. Uh, so the mythology around uh, what actually happened uh, in 1969 begins to grow. So, as author David Stradling put it, there is considerable confusion surrounding the 1969 fire. However, also borrowing from Stradling's analysis, the, quote, mythology of the event grew. According to a recent article in the Smithsonian Magazine, the river had previously caught fire in 1868, in 1883, in 1887, 1912, 1922, 1936, 1941, in 1948, and in 1952. 
But as the title of this contemporary article suggests, one which we'll link on our featured resources page, no one cared until 1969. Within months, Congress established the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, which itself was followed by new landmark legislation, such as the Clean Water Act. Let's conclude our visit to Cleveland, Ohio, by focusing on one of the most immediate effects of the 1969 fire, the establishment of the EPA. Here's Senator Tom Carper, Democrat of Delaware. That agency created by President Richard Nixon and a bipartisan Congress 46 years ago is tasked with implementing our nation's most important clean air, clean water, and safe chemical laws. The EPA is required to use sound science to protect both our environment and our public health. By and large, the EPA has done this successfully for decades while our economy has continued to grow. Many in this room today may not remember a time before the EPA, a time when states had to work individually to protect citizens in the community in which they lived, a time before the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act were signed into law, a time when businesses operating throughout the U.S. were faced with a myriad of conflicting state and local laws affecting our health and our environment. The choking smog and soot the half century ago seem unfathomable now. Rivers on fire and deadly toxic plumes sound like something from another world, impossible in our United States of America. Today we have the luxury of largely forgetting these frightening circumstances thanks to the efforts of the Environmental Protection Agency, its employees, in partnership with state and local agencies and with companies across America. In fact, the EPA and its many partners throughout this country have been so successful that it's easy for some of us to forget just why this agency is so critical. And for some, it's also easy to presume that not much more, there's not much more for the agency to do, and that just could not be further from the truth. The environmental threats that we face today are real, and they don't respect state boundaries. In the clip, Senator Carper contrasts life before and after the EPA, noting that disasters, quote, don't respect state boundaries. The EPA provides a mechanism for the federal government to respond to disasters that can have far-reaching effects as we'll continue to explore with our next visit. Growing up in the New York City area, I distinctly remember March 28th, 1979. The nightly news stories, articles in the papers, and conversation around the kitchen table. Talking about the partial meltdown at the Three Mile Island Unit 2 nuclear reactor near Middletown, Pennsylvania, which, according to the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, was considered, quote, the most serious accident in U.S. commercial nuclear power plant operating history. And as a child, I recall wondering if and how this could impact our community. To provide background on this event, let's listen to a clip from a program that features former archivist at the University of Pittsburgh, Nancy Watson, talking about how that day unfolded for the newly sworn in Pennsylvania Governor Thornburg. Wednesday, March 28th, it was announcing to the new governor uh, that there was this accident at the nearby nuclear plant on the Three Mile Island. He realized nuclear accident had amazing repercussions and uncertainties and difficulties ahead. And then the next morning, early in the day, his notes refer to having heard mention of a fuel core damage and consulting through the whole day. That did not change, but what to do was an enigma. Thornburg was well enough read and knew from the very start an accident at a nuclear plant was something truly serious. And immediately he had to pull together a very small group of people that he could trust to pursue the needs about emergency plans for Pennsylvania. And he himself had to be sure that the public, once they knew about this accident, was consistently, appropriately, calmly informed. As time went on trying to understand really what happened, the, the reports were conflicting. Every day, practically every hour, there was a change. And this one, for example, says, there's absolutely no danger of a meltdown. As he underlined, there were conflicting reports. Someone else said there's no radioactive material released. Well, there was. 
and that became known later that day and ongoing. Uh, that there was a leak and radiation had been released. It was a matter of how much and what to do about it. The company itself reversed its opinions and its statements almost hourly, so they were, they were useful. And his own personnel at that point weren't nuclear experts, so he really was rather at sea until he could find someone somehow to get the facts, the real facts. The video from this program is appealing because it shows Governor Thornburg's minute-by-minute notes of the incident with changes as updated information was learned, which is a rich primary source for students to see. And with so many unknowns after the initial accident, recommendations were made, including advising people in the area to stay indoors and suggesting mothers with children leave the area and shelter in other locations for several days. Teams swung into action. Governor Thornburg connected with President Carter, requesting support. And in response, the president sent a military helicopter with scientists and people from the Nuclear Regulatory Agency to assess the situation. Harold Denton, an engineer with the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, was among that group. Let's listen to his remarks after the initial evaluation. There's about 100,000 gallons of highly contaminated water in the primary system that's being circulated around cooling the core. All the water that was spilled inside the containment is still inside the containment. That's uh, roughly 600,000 gallons of highly contaminated water. Uh, I see no uh, imminent uh, chance for any of that water being released. But that water has got to be cleaned up, both the water that's in the bottom of the containment and the water that's in the primary system, and the walls of the containment have to be washed down and that activity collected, and that decontamination must go on. I think the agency in Washington didn't really understand themselves how serious it was until Harold, in fact, and the team got there, could take a look and determine that it was pretty serious, but ultimately they were able to ascertain that it, the, the so-called bubble was not going to burst and there was not going to be a meltdown, which was what language was out there for people's fears. Several agencies were involved in the investigation to determine what occurred that day, what the impact on health and the environment was through capturing thousands of samples of air, water, including the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay, vegetation, soil, and food, and implementing a plan to vent the radioactive gas from the building as part of the cleanup of this accident. So what was learned from this incident? Samuel Walker, former U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission historian and author of Three Mile Island, A Nuclear Crisis in Historical Perspective, explains. The major lesson that was learned was in not enough attention had been paid to, to what were called human factors uh, as, as a cause of a nuclear plant accident. What we learned uh, after Three Mile Island was that the operators should have been trained better. Uh, we also learned that the instrument panels had to be redesigned so that they could provide useful information, which the operators were not getting uh, as the accident proceeded. We also learned that we had to pay a lot more attention to uh, emergency planning. And we also learned that we have to, we, we being the country, uh, we also learned that we have to uh, concentrate more on plant management because too many utilities that owned nuclear plants at that time uh, saw it as just another way to boil water and didn't really pay enough attention to what needed to be done to make certain that plants were safe. It doesn't mean that an accident is, um, is out of the question um, but it does mean that it's much less likely than it was 40 years ago. In addition to lessons learned, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission website states, quote, its small radioactive releases had no detectable health effects on plant workers or the public. Three Mile Island is no longer in operation, completely shutting down in 2019. And after learning about this historical event and conducting their own research, students can choose different paths to explore to learn more. What role did the EPA play regarding this disaster and how did it expand? What are some alternative sources to nuclear fuel? Are there lingering effects from this event in the community today? They can research additional nuclear accidents as well, such as Chernobyl, and compare them. What occurred? Who was responsible? And how did the government respond?
We're making our way northwest across the country to the wilderness frontier of Alaska. We'll next discuss an event that occurred on March 24th, 1989, when the oil tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground on a shallow rocky outcrop in Prince William Sound, spilling over 10 million gallons of oil and making it one of the largest environmental disasters in US history. But before we get into what unfolded that day, let's learn a little bit more about the history and significance of the oil industry in Alaska from Stan Jones, a former investigative reporter with the Anchorage Daily News. The modern oil industry that we know today got its start in Alaska in 1967 when there was a huge oil strike at Prudhoe Bay on the state's north slope. Uh, the pipeline began operating in 1973 and that's when the tanker traffic in Prince William Sound began. So about 16 years, 15 years passed before the spill. The oil industry in Alaska, from the day oil was discovered, had an enormous mind share in this state. It was instantly recognized as the biggest source of funding for state government. For a long time, it was the only source that mattered. The, the, the oil industry produced money so fast into state coffers that one of the jokes was even the Alaska legislature couldn't waste it all. So some of it was accumulated in what we call the permanent fund. A lot of it was spent on state services. Um, so the oil industry, besides generating all this money, took an acute interest in politics because they're always interested in taxes and in regulation. So over time, their influence over the legislature became enormous and it was almost mandatory to be oil friendly to get elected to the legislature in this state. Who were some of the, uh, the big companies who were operating out of here? Well, the big three uh, were and are BP, ExxonMobil, and ConocoPhillips. Uh, over time, the, the names have changed as companies merged and absorbed each other. So early in the day, uh, what's now Conoco was, was really Arco but the big three players haven't changed much. With regards to oil spills, it seems we only really hear and read about them when they are significantly large in scope. However, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Damage Assessment, Remediation and Restoration Program website indicates that they respond to approximately 150 spills across the US throughout each calendar year. So what happened that day in Prince William Sound that made the headlines across the world? Stan Jones continues. The tanker left Valdez a little bit before midnight and sailed out of Valdez and, and through Prince William Sound. And at 12.04 a.m. on the 24th of March, which was Good Friday, uh, it hit Bly Reef, which was a well-known and well-marked navigational hazard in Prince William Sound. What had happened before, earlier, earlier in the day, there had been reports of icebergs in the tanker lanes. So the captain requested permission to deviate from the tanker lanes to avoid these icebergs in case they were still there. So it's a fairly tricky maneuver, but nothing unusual. It happened all the time. And the failure was to return to the tanker lanes at the proper point, and instead the ship sailed into, into this reef. There were some conditions on the ship that contributed to the accident. The master was a guy named Joe Hazelwood. Uh, there was always a question as to whether he was drinking, and if he was drinking, was it a factor? That was never established clearly, and I kind of doubt it myself. Um, what he did was to put the third mate in charge of the bridge and go below to do paperwork. The tanker crews, and this was identified as one of the factors in the accident, were worked very hard. The size of the crews on these ships had been reduced over the years. So there was a constant battle with fatigue and overwork and stress for these crews, and that was identified as a contributing factor. At any rate, the third mate was in charge of the bridge. As a technical matter, he wasn't qualified to be doing what he was doing, and he shouldn't have been. But again, it comes back to the workload and the, the skinniness of the crews on those tankers. Um, and all of those things were addressed after the spill and, and theoretically remedied. One of the methods to help contain and quote unquote clean up the massive oil slick included the use of chemical dispersants, in addition to burning the oil, which appeared to be the more effective procedure in removing the slick. However, due to the weather and significant tidal currents that raise and lower the water levels by as much as 10 foot every six hours in the sound, the devastated area was far too vast to continue with burning as a viable option. 
The impact of these devastating and preventable occurrences can lead to long sustained damage and destruction of habitats, fish and wildlife, as well as directly affecting the lives, jobs and the economy of the people and surrounding communities as a whole. 25 years later, on the anniversary of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, former University of Alaska professor Rick Steiner talked about the long-term impact of this disaster. One take-home message from Exxon Valdez is that it is not over. The damage persists in quite remarkable ways. There was a promise made to the people of America before they built the Trans-Alaska Pipeline that all the technology in the world will be in this system, You'll, it'll be safe, there will be not one drop spilled. Obviously, as soon as the approval was granted, all those promises evaporated. Exxon Valdez grounds on March 24, 1989, uh, and spilling 40, 50, 60,000 tons of very toxic Alaska North Slope crude oil spreading over about 10,000 square miles of Alaska's coastal ocean, ending up oiling over 1,300 miles of a very pristine shoreline, many national parks, wildlife refuges, one of our nation's largest national forests, indigenous lands. And we knew the, uh, the damage, the images that everybody saw that year were spectacularly horrible with the otters dying and birds dying. The acute mortality was spectacular. But 25 years later, what we have learned is that the injury persists. Thirt uh, most of the monitored fish and wildlife populations and habitats that the governments have monitored are still not fully recovered. Let me say this again. Most of the fish and wildlife populations have not fully recovered. Some, uh, the AT1 killer whale pod, pigeon guillemots, and Pacific herring that Dune just mentioned are listed a quarter of a century later as not recovering not recovering. The AT1 killer whale pod was 22 members prior to the spill. We saw them surfacing in the oil that summer. They dropped to seven members, lost the reproductive females, and now the, this is not our quote, this is from the government trustee council. They, they conclude that there is no hope for recovery of this killer whale pod because they will not, the last calf they had was just before the oil spill. They will not reproduce and they expect them to go extinct. The take home from this is there will not be, there will never be full recovery from the Exxon Valdez oil spill, period. This has to you know, be figured into our risk calculus about oil development, drilling, transportation, pipelines, shipping, anywhere and everywhere. We have to simply be honest. Looking back at state and federal government response to disasters like this can provide us with the opportunity to reflect on the steps that can be taken to prevent these kinds of events from happening in the first place. And it also provides an opportunity to consider improved methods and technology to mitigate damages when incidents do occur, and to reflect on the way in which we can improve communications between the varying levels of government officials with the private sector and those in impacted communities. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Damage Assessment Remediation and Restoration Program website says, quote, ultimately the Exxon Valdez spill resulted in a close examination of the status of oil spill prevention, response, and cleanup in the United States. And one result was the passage of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which led to the establishment of the Damage Assessment Remediation and Restoration Program, end quote. Oil drilling and exploration in Alaska continues to be an issue of local, state, and nationwide contention for communities, oil companies, activists, lawmakers, and regulators. And if you recall, in an earlier clip, we heard from Stan Jones that ConocoPhillips has been a part of oil and drilling programs in Alaska for many years now. And currently on the table is their proposal for the Willow Energy Project. That's a multi-billion dollar program to drill oil and gas in Alaska's North Slope. So that's a hot topic that's being debated at the state and national levels, as well as among environmental groups. And will the Willow Project help the U.S. reduce our dependence on foreign sources of oil if the project moves forward? How much revenue will it bring to the state of Alaska? How will it impact the wilderness and wildlife of the area? And how may it impact the environment now and into the future? Well, this could be a great topic for students to research and to learn more about the various perspectives on the issue. They can use C-SPAN clips of journalists and politicians discussing domestic oil exploration and production. They can cite information they discover from reliable sources that are covering the issue of oil and gas drilling in Alaska and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. 
and then they can summarize and determine their own opinions on how they think we should weigh environmental concerns against domestic energy production and consumption needs. Finally, we're going back to Ohio, where the recent train derailment in East Palestine on February 3rd, 2023, is still being investigated. What caused the incident? What cargo was being shipped? In which cars was it located? Do the materials that are being shipped, including hazardous chemicals, need to be disclosed as a train passes through different states? What is the impact on the people in the community and the environment? As we await those answers, C-SPAN's programs cover current events and public policy issues that offer viewers a variety of perspectives so they have access to information to determine for themselves what they think about a particular topic. And as this event unfolds, we've had guests on to share their viewpoints, including toxicologist and chemical safety consultant Gerald Pochi, who spoke about the risk of toxic exposure sustained by residents of East Palestine. Let's listen to what he has to say. You mentioned in our pre, our short pre-chat before we came on the air here, a term, you, your concern over what you call the downwinders of this of this spill, of this accident, and the controlled burn they had right. a- after that. What are some of your concern about those people and, um, and, and the, the after effects of this, this spill? Well, through a lot of um, release of information about the incident, you know, I sit here in Vienna, Virginia, so I'm not immediately close to the poor community in East Palestine, but it's right on the border with Pennsylvania. And so when the incident began around 9 p.m. on February 3rd, there was a large release and a fire ensued. That fire burned from February 3rd to February 8th, so six days worth of open pit burning. And that open pit burning not only included the cars burning on themselves, but a decision to have a release burn because there was greater fear that um, there could be an explosive release of a vinyl chloride car. So that's the immediate fears for the community's exposure that generated much interest. And I dare say there were horrific photos and videos on all sorts of TV media about the clouds that emanated from that burn. That's something a toxicologist looks at and says, I wish I had samples of that cloud and samples closest Mm. to the people and the environment as it burned. So as a public affairs television network, we cover breaking news differently to that of a typical news outlet, and it's often in the form of the government's response to that breaking news. As such, we often cover press conferences that feature conversations with elected officials at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as community members, and bureaucratic response from federal agencies that may also be involved. As our team sifts through these programs to create nonpartisan resources for teachers to use with their students, we created an On This Day in History resource on the recent train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, and that features a variety of perspectives, including the administrator of the EPA, a chemical safety consultant, a transportation reporter, as well as the chairwoman of the National Transportation Safety Board, Jennifer Homendy, and she shared her experience working on disasters throughout her career at the NTSB, as well as the goal for the agency as it related to the toxic chemical spill in Ohio. Over the course of my career, and I've handled rail and pipeline and hazmat for well over 25 years, both Rob and I have sat with communities, with residents after devastating rail, pipeline, hazardous materials releases. We've talked to community members who are suffering health effects, have pets who've died, have damage to businesses and homes. But I can tell you this much, this was 100% preventable. We call things accidents, there is no accident. Every single event that we investigate is preventable. So our hearts are with you. Know that the NTSB has one goal, and that is safety and ensuring that this never happens again. So why teach students about these events or ask them to research the environmental impact of those that may have happened in your state or community in the past? Or simply put, they can learn about real issues that impact them and their families. And it also generates a connection to what they may be learning about in school with regards to the role of government, bureaucracy, regulation, and oversight, 
and it provides the opportunity for them to problem solve and consider how we can avoid future disasters while weighing the needs of communities, businesses, and the nation at large. While Earth Day is still a little over a month away to be celebrated on April 22nd, it seems fitting to conclude today's episode with a quote from Rachel Carson, whose writing sparked the modern American environmental conservation movement and the first Earth Day in 1970. This quote comes from her 1962 book, Silent Spring. Quote, Those who contemplate the beauty of the Earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. As always, you'll find all of the resources that we highlighted in this episode and more on our featured resources page at www.cspan.org classroom. And if you'd ever like to connect with our team to learn more about what we have to offer for teachers and students, please email us anytime at educate at cspan.org. History and events are reflected not only in traditional and digital media and on social platforms, but also in literature, art, and music as well. And to wrap up today's discussion on environmental disasters, we remember the Gulf of Mexico oil spill in April 2010, the lives that were lost and the devastation to the environment, wildlife, and greater community, and lessons learned. As we sign off, we'll listen to artist Drew Landry performing his song about this disaster and its impact on people in the region. As a reminder, please remember to like and follow our podcast wherever you listen so you don't miss our next episode. Until then, thank you for joining us. And grew up on the southern shore But Louisiana night ain't no more Kicking mud up off a crawfish hole And barefooted with a fishing pole and Make a living with my own two hands and Hell, it's part of being who I am I went to working in the oil field That's the only way to pay our bills And if I'm lucky, I could have a son I take him hunting like his daddy done and Get him working on a shrimping boat Up and down the Gulf of Mexico Living dead out on a deep sea rig Doing what it is they had to live All bleeding from a gaping hole up and down the Gulf of Mexico, Morgan City down to Mobile Bay, past Cagoula down to FLA, and still I'm stuck out here for seven more, watching everything turn black offshore, and brother, even if they cap the well, the hell is just another oil spill, a way of life won't be around no more, and all I wanted was to go back home.